Hi. Um, yes, as um, Richard said, uh, each of the panels panelists will introduce themselves quickly. So very quickly for me, uh, as Richard said, my name is James Shotter. I've arrived in Poland about a month ago from Germany, uh, where I covered finance for the FT, and before that I was in Switzerland. Um, first of all, obviously, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself quickly as well. Uh, Vita Tarwoski, I already has been, <laughs> has been presented here. I'm a professor of economics. I hope it works. Hello, I'm Ovidiu Drang, ambassador of Romania to Poland, and I've been working before coming to, uh, to Poland as tech secretary in the foreign ministry, and before that, ambassador uh, of Romania to Brussels, bilateral. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vavzhnyi Smoczynski. I'm the managing director of Politica Insight, which is the leading <coughs> provider of political and economic analysis on Poland here. If you have received, perhaps yesterday, an invitation to look into our service, that's the service from which I'm coming, so. Well, thank you all very much. Um, well, perhaps I might pick up uh, where um, Professor Orlovsky left off in his uh, presentation on some of the, the challenges to the, to, the, to the growth model in the region. Um, and perhaps if I might start with you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, um, given that the situation in Romania at the moment politically is quite interesting. Um, you could, you've had uh, protests at the beginning of the year, and a certain amount of political turbulence continuing even this week with the ousting of one prime minister replacement with another. Um, and as, your, uh, as President Johannes uh, nominated the new Prime Minister, he said that he acknowledged that there were concerns about the impact of the political situation on the economy. So I'd be very interested to hear from you how seriously do you think the political turbulence in Romania uh, is likely to affect the economy and do you see any problems there for the country or the region as a whole? Thank you very much, but let me first uh, thank uh, the organizers for uh, this event. Uh, it is an excellent idea and uh, I'm really honored to, uh, to participate. Well, the uh, so-called political crisis in Romania uh, is uh, very close to an end. The, uh, pr the new prime minister, Mr. Tudose, has been nominated as a candidate for this position by the president. He is assembling now a new team in, 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 in Bucharest, and I suppose, we suppose, we hope that tomorrow we will have a new government voted by, uh, by the parliament. So, the, cri the crisis is over. The good news, uh, another good news, is that uh, this, uh, this change of government, I would not name it a crisis, uh, which was done according to the book, uh, democratically uh, and uh, fully uh, transparently uh, according to democratic uh, rules and uh, norms, has not affected in any way um, the economy. That's a good sign for the economy, that's a good sign for the um, political system in Romania. Uh, it means that the economy it has turned immune to political changes, even to a change of the government. It means that the uh, democratic system is uh, solid enough to absorb such a, uh, well, some could say shock, uh, in the very in, in a very smooth way, and uh, here we are with now uh, a new government a new government in the making uh, that would apply uh, almost uh, surely the same um, program that has been adopted last year by the parliament uh, following uh, um, uh, the elections. Uh, then, well, I, th I think it's, uh, it's good not only for Romania, it's good for the region, it's a good sign that a uh, Central and Eastern European country, after 10 years since, uh, while well, joining the European Union, has managed to, um, how should I say, um, perform uh, very well a kind of a uh, stress test, if I can say so. And that's uh, important because uh, we have uh, around us, uh, in our eastern neighborhood, uh, uh, instability, tensions, uh, and uh, we have to be as stable and as successful as possible being, well, the, at the eastern frontier of the uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, community. Thank you very much. Uh, Vavgenius, perhaps I could bring you in there as well uh, on the Polish perspective, because this is also another country in the region that's had a certain amount of political turbulence over the last 18 months. Do you, are, you, are you picking up any signs that investors are unsettled by the noise? Are you concerned that eventually this could undermine Poland's growth story? Yeah, we have been advising investors on political risk in Poland for the past four years. And we can definitely say that there uh, is a renewed intense interest over the past two years in political analysis on Poland. Uh, because Poland has been for 20 years, for the first 20 years after the communist, uh, the capitalist transformation, the democratic transformation, actually a no problem country in terms of political stability. There have been difficulties to secure permits and there, have been, there has been government change in Poland, uh, but never has there been over the first 20 years any concern as to the mid and long term outlook of the country in terms of 
liberties, uh, regulatory stability, and, and fiscal stability. So there has been considerable concern following the 2015 election, and we have seen a spike then in the first 12 months of interest. Mm, and definitely investors keep an eye on the political developments uh, because of all the negative publicity that Poland gets uh, uh, in, in, in the international press regarding the Constitutional Tribunal, regarding recent changes to, to the judiciary, uh, and regarding uh, certain statements which were, uh, which were investor unfriendly, foreign investor unfriendly. And also, for example, the, the polonization, so-called polonization of the banking sector. But broadly, I would say that investors have kept their cool over Poland and with good results for themselves, in the sense that, yes, there are certain parts of the economy where investors have fled, like the wind, wind industry, wind farms, for example, have been essentially rendered unviable in Poland. Uh, but then, for example, the automotive industry has benefited very much over the past two years uh, by uh, jumping on the train of Mr. Morawiecki, who wanted to have more uh, uh, hard investment, visible plants, uh, uh, high-tech investment into production capacities. So, uh, our, the, the analysis that we give to investors who are mulling and, and entering into Poland is uh, do avoid sectors which are highly regulated, do avoid sectors where there is a state-owned incumbent, because this incumbent will be held by the current government, uh, but do look into sectors which are related to hard investment, visible investment, product, uh, pro investment production capacities. So uh, I would avoid banking, retail, uh, energy, media, and pharma probably to some extent, but would really look into production, BPO, real estate, mining to some extent, because there is, uh, as you know, as a, as a fallout from, uh, from the general fascination with coal in Poland, a renewed interest into investment into mining, and startups are obviously high on the government's agenda because they are the, uh, the, you know, a, a confirmation of interest in innovation. Do you think there's a sense uh, that the government's bark is worse than its bite? I mean, I think, for example, of you know, the, the initial pledges that President Duda made in his election campaign in 2015 about uh, foreign exchange mortgages, for example. Those proposals haven't made it all the way through to being implemented. Do you think that's partly the reason that investors have been relatively calm about the situation? Uh, yes, we also tell, tell investors they should divide what is being told in public by four, uh, and then look really at what is being implemented afterwards. Uh, but uh, the barking ho also has its effects. I spent the past two, year, two days in, in, in Berlin talking to policymakers, and there is definitely a visible and palpable uh, shift in attitude of, of uh, other European member states regarding Poland, which will have a mid and long term effect on Poland's, of the, on, on the perception of Poland in other capitals. As a consequence, its capacity to play an important leading role in EU policy making, and as a consequence, also the attitude of some investors in those countries from which a lot of the capital in Poland is being sourced. So as much as I would say the bite hasn't been as uh, strong as the, as the barking, uh, I think the government, the current government in Warsaw underestimates the potential negative effect on Poland in the mid and long term. Uh, th there is concern about Central Europe uh, more broadly that the, the era of Europeanization is over. The era when Central European countries simply implemented and were catching up uh, not only economically, but also in an ideological sense with Western Europe is, uh, is I think, over. And uh, the, the, the populist moment that we are experiencing in several countries is, in, in, in my opinion, a transitionary period. Uh, Poles and other societies will have to decide whether they, will, they want a more cosmopolitan road of development for their countries or a more closed, uh, conservative, uh, model without you know deciding which is better it's simply it, it, it is it will be a protracted decision time and that will in effect in the long term impact also the capacity of the region to attract investments well that brings us quite nicely onto my next uh, area of questions which I which um, professor you, you touched on in your presentation um, 
you know, clearly access to EU funding has been a big part of the uh, success story in the region in the last few years. There have been noises in Berlin, in Paris recently about linking EU funding to what one might loosely call good European behaviour, you know, whether it's in accepting refugees, whether it's in issues like the rule of law. How much of a threat do you see, uh, Professor Wolfsey, in, 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 in the coming you know, budget rounds uh, towards uh, the sort of central European growth model if those sort of uh, threats get carried out? Well, as a typical two-handed economist, I will first st say something that, uh, uh, well, I don't think is uh, well understood in Poland, that the role of the EU funds in the development of long run is not really as huge as people tend to believe. Uh, this is very important for the infrastructure uh, improvement uh, that has been already, but this is not the story that the that Poland uh, has been growing over the last 25 years because of the EU funds, by the way, the EU funds we have uh, only for uh, one third of this period. Moreover, uh, well, uh, actually, the, his German example is showing that the, the money themselves do not solve the problem of the economic growth, right? They can be useful if well used, but, uh, but uh, definitely this is not the story that Poland or Hungary or Czech Republic had been growing because of the EU funds. The EU funds had some um, impact on the long-term uh, growth uh, prospects because of improving the business environment, especially the infrastructure. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt that the inflow of the influx of the funds uh, contributed to the to this, uh, uh, at least in Poland, to this euro enthusiasm of of, of, of Poles. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, in a short run, sometimes it added to the. Uh, business cycle. Unfortunately, it was uh, um, sometimes we've got uh, the one percentage of the extra growth because of that. Sometimes we have one percent of the uh, mi minus one percent of the growth because depending either the EU money are accelerating or decelerating. We had uh, last year we had the situation when less and of the EU funds than before because of the change of the EU uh, seven years uh, framework, financial framework, it caused the economy to grow 1% slower. So this short-term demand input is not, uh, okay, it's important, it's visible, but it's not the key issue here. The improvement in infrastructure, no doubt about that, but still having said so, I must say, I'm not a strong believer in the um, GDP growth effects of the investment made by the state. <laughs> Uh, this is not the most effective investment. That a lot of this money are being wasted, and so uh, my first half of the answer is: uh, we tend to uh, exaggerate with thinking this is not the story that those region has been growing because of the EU funds, but they were useful. Now, what are the prospects? Okay, the prospects are not 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 good because. Uh, the tensions between Brussels and uh, Mr. Macron was the President Macron was the first one to say it openly. No, actually, it was Hollande, Hollande who said that you, you've got. You have principles, uh, we have structural and we've funds. We've got the structural funds, yeah. Uh, but uh, most likely, nobody will uh, make it an open policy of cutting the structural funds for Central Europe. But uh, the new negotiations are going to be very tough because there will be less money because of the Brexit, because there will be more pressure for changing the, 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 the distribution of the EU spending uh, among various envelopes. And from that point of view, uh, Poland and other C countries, well, actually, the other countries may only suffer because, uh, country of region may suffer because of the fact that Poland is doing its best to weaken its negotiation position within the uh, EU. So we can see much less, much, much less of the EU funds coming in after 2020. Uh, this is not going to be the economic catastrophe, but uh, for this uh, Euro enthusiastic feelings of Poles, it, it may have some uh, impact uh, as well. Definitely, it will be the problem for all the countries here if uh, in the financing of the infrastructure development and improvement that still needs the improvement, upgrading, uh, if there is much less of the EU funds, and I guess that's a very likely scenario. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, perhaps I could bring you in on the same question, uh, but also broaden it out slightly in that even if one is relatively relaxed about um, uh, the issue of uh, European funding as, a, as the professor is, there are clearly other issues where um, the election of President Macron in France potentially presages uh, a push for deeper integration in Europe. Um, he's also made some sort of protectionist noises about um, you know, posted workers. 
Are you, uh, so, as well as the issue of structural funds, how concerned are you about the issue of uh, the emergence of a two-speed Europe in the future if there's deeper integration, and how much of a risk would it be for the region if some of the countries here found themselves in the slow lane? Well, um, let me first uh, take uh, um, one of the points made by, by Professor Orlovsky. Uh, I, I, I think there is, um, the, the truth might be uh, somewhere in the middle. Well, of course, uh, um, European funds are not a name in itself. They, uh, they help a lot. They have helped a lot uh, uh, Central and Eastern European countries, Romania in particular, because we have started with a, well, a low level in terms of uh, economic development, infrastructure, things like that. Uh, so we should not uh, uh, underestimate, but also not, not overestimate the importance of, uh, of uh, European funds. Uh, what I would say is that we need to find additional complementary mechanisms that would help us generate, I would say, not national, but local capital as well. This is a, a, an idea that has been flagged around in Central Europe, but not only. We have to rely on uh, our own resources as, as much as we do uh, rely on, on European funds. And this is a challenge for not only for, well, our governments, but also for our private sectors as well. And this is important, something that has to be taken into consideration by our political leaders. Uh, now, um, before uh, answering to the second part of your question, let me tell you that, uh, well, I think we are now in a very good situation in Central Europe. Professor Olowski highlighted some of the figures. I can add uh, some other figures and, for instance, point out the fact that Romania uh, had last year uh, uh, an economic growth of uh, uh, GDP growth of 4.9 percent, uh, which is uh, actually the, the highest in 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 in, uh, in the European Union, and uh, this is uh, not uh, something that well someone could say. But it's only for 2016. This is the uh, has been the uh, uh, third year in a row uh, uh, at this at this uh, almost at this level. And things are better also because, well, there is uh, something else for, uh, uh, that we can talk about uh, in terms of assets in, in, in Central Europe. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, well, investors uh, tend to perceive Central Europe as an uh, attractive destination because of the low level of wages. I think this is not fair because what's happening now is that we have, first of all, um, a very talented labor force. Uh, it's, it's worth mentioning the fact that uh, Poland, Romania, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and, uh, and Ukraine provide the market with 300,000 engineers. Uh, uh, and, and this is every year uh, more than the US. And this is, I think, something that should be taken into consideration. Secondly, uh, there is a, a, a significant tangible, I would say, um, culture of cooperation uh, between among uh, uh, Central European countries. We are only uh, one week ahead of a very important meeting of Central European countries, the so-called uh, Three Seas Initiative, uh, where uh, President Trump and uh, uh, 12 uh, presidents from the region will come. And uh, this is a good sign because uh, I think uh, Central Europe is first uh, first of all, at this moment at least, uh, it is about uh, better connectivity and uh, increased, uh, well, increased stability and uh, uh, more trust. Trust that would really have an impact for, for, uh, for investors because this region has been uh, stable for, for such a long time and this is good for a good basis for the future. Now, in terms of th three speed, two speeds uh, Europe, I think uh, we should uh, think in a in a different way, if I may. It is about um, uh, what uh, kind of Europe we are uh, thinking about uh, uh, when we're talking about, well, uh, three uh, speeds or two speeds or multiple speeds Europe. We have actually in Europe uh, different uh, uh, groups. We have the Eurozone, we have the Schengen Zone, we have already a kind, some some differences within the European Union family. But this has not prevented the Union to make some progress. Over, over, even over the last decade, uh, 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 and uh, now we are uh, witnessing a, uh, a recovery, an economic recovery, and this is, this is a, a, good, a good sign for the future. I think we, should, uh, we, 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 ha we have to put things in a strategic perspective. What we need now is to save the European project as a whole. Because around us, what we can see is our signs of instability and, and huge, even vital challenges. 
And I'm thinking what's happening in the South, what's happening in, in our East, and we have to stay together somehow uh, uh, facing these challenges. And I'm thinking about one of the most important assets um, uh, a region has or a country has, that is security. An investor would look to a region or to a country through these eyes, the eyes of, well, how, how secure is that destination for my, for my money? Is it, does it belong to a, an alliance that provides security? Does it belong to a region that has enjoyed stability for the last uh, 10 and 15, uh, uh, or, or 15 years? Europe has managed to preserve peace and stability for such a long time. And this is, I think, the first idea that we have to put on the table. What can we do to stay together, whatever happens around us? And um, if this is somehow resolved by, uh, during the discussion regarding the future of Europe, then we can talk about how many speeds we want. It's important to have a sense of commonality, a sense of common purpose. And that, then the rest, I think, to a certain extent, extent is about uh, technicalities. Uh, Vapsinius, perhaps I could bring you in on the same point. I mean, particularly after what you were saying about your meetings in Berlin, do you get the sense that a, that a two-speed Europe could be a threat to, to Poland or other Central European countries? I think the, the ambassador posted uh, um, it, it's a wishful condition if I may, in the sense that we would all wish for uh, the 28 countries, 27, to converge in terms of, a, of an idea of, 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 of a common idea of Europe, but it seems that we are in a period of divergence, growing divergence. And countries, governments, and, and societies seem to be uh, accepting that fact and actually mulling over how to organize Europe in a way where we can live with those differences uh, in a productive way. So my personal opinion is that multi-speed Europe is already happening, that it will, uh, it will become an even more visible fact over the next five to ten years. Uh, there is an immense ex amount of expectation and hope among uh, West Europeans as to the presidency of Macron and his ability actually to push for a more integrated Eurozone. Mm -hmm. uh, he seems to be articulating things that everybody else thinks should, should happen. But, uh, to leave the wider Europe uh, in the state where it is right now and to integrate further and more deeply within the Eurozone. There is a reluctance on the side of Germany who would have to finance that project and of smaller Eurozone countries who are obviously a little bit frightened about this increasing power of, a, of, a, of Germany within this Franco-German alliance. On the other hand, you also very much hear from German policymakers that they know that they need Poland and Central Europe within Europe uh, long term. They don't want to be left alone uh, with uh, southern countries who are requesting money from them. They want to have that counterbalance within the EU in the form of, uh, of Eastern European uh, economies and societies. At the same time, they have, they, they, they might, one might say, they hold a grudge because it goes beyond policymakers. I mean, Germans are to some extent even offended with the rule of law situation in Poland. Uh, remember that Germany has a tradition of a constitutional court which is extremely important and in Germany, das Verfassungsgericht in Karlsruhe. The French are very unhappy about posted workers and general capital flight and uh, product, uh, uh, production flight to, to Central Europe. And the Southerners, Italians uh, and Spaniards and the Greek are really unhappy about the Polish attitude towards migrants. So on those three issues really, really are on a back foot, not just Poland, but, but the region in general uh, in Western Europe. That feeds into this logic, oh, okay, we are different from the East Europeans, so we are, in a sense, ex excused to pursue further integration within the Eurozone. Uh, but all that integration hinges on the reforms by Macron, which are a big question mark. Let's see and let's hope he will reform France, and Germany's acceptance that in return for those labor market and other economic reforms, Germany will agree to a common budget. I would say, you know, post-2020, don't hope for a big budget for the common Europe. Even without Macron, there would be cuts, there would be a realignment, more money would go into instruments where money is being borrowed to companies in Central Europe and has to be returned. Uh, there will be more conditionality on those funds. You know, the rule of law is one track, but there is another track of added European value. Projects in, in Central Europe, for example, a bridge in a small locality in Poland, 
post-2020 will be vetted against their European added value. That will make investment in Poland way more difficult with EU funds. So I think Poland should get out of the mindset that a lot of money will keep on flowing into Poland post-2020 and has to look for a new growth model. The one thing I would just, just very brief two, two notes. One is that uh, look at Poland also at its relative uh, attractiveness as compared to countries like Turkey or Russia. Poland is having its problems, but it's, it is relatively a safer place than countries like Turkey and Russia who were our competitors 10 years ago. And the second point, what we are looking very much at is what is really behind the curve? What is really behind the hill? Uh, the Polish economy is stepping out of its midterm phase of development. New innovations will come out of the private sector, even if there is no outright innovation policy from the government. You will see new trends emerging in this country. We will be leapfrogging certain sectors. So not everything positive is predictable. There are opportunities which will come in this country by virtue of the fact that it is developing into a high-income economy. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think as we're uh, sort of running short on time, I'll open the uh, question round out now to the floor. So um, I think are there uh, are some microphones anywhere that can go out? Right. So who? Uh, any 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 questions for the panel? Could I actually start with a question um, for the ambassador? Um, I mean, the, everyone's really encouraged by the the way that Romania has really. Um, I mean, people are talking about it. There's a buzz about Romania, uh, despite some of the political situations, but. You know, in 2008, um, there was a huge flight of capital, I think more dramatic than in, in most countries. Um, what lessons did Romania learn from that for the future, just to, you know, to, to um, encourage investors to come back and not to worry that this could happen again? Well, uh, I, I mentioned some of the figures. I think um, uh, what an investor should look to uh, when uh, deciding what, whether uh, uh, he or she should, should invest in Romania is, I would say, macro stability. Uh, and this is uh, one of our key assets. Uh, uh, maybe for five years in a row, uh, macroeco macroeconomic figures are quite in the safe zone, and this is going to stay like this for the years to come, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, secondly, uh, well, we have uh, recently introduced uh, a system of uh, uh, lower taxes, and it's also an incentive for, for investors, I, I, would, I would guess. And uh, at the same time, we have introduced uh, measures that would secure predictability of the overall economic, uh, uh, rela econ economy related uh, legal framework. And predictability is also an asset in this respect. As far as the capital is concerned, I think, well, um, looking at the figures uh, again, uh, we have now uh, a very good perspective in attracting uh, a venture capital. Romania, like other countries in this region, particularly Poland, uh, has uh, chosen the path of innovation as one of the key growth engines. And uh, we are on the right track uh, uh, as far as innovation and uh, uh, creative industries are concerned. Let me, let me uh, tell you something. Uh, I, I really like to, to underline this idea that has been flagged in, in, in Warsaw, actually. And uh, I'm, I was, uh, I was uh, uh, privileged to interact with uh, the originators of this idea. Central and Eastern Europe has a, a very good chance to become a startup region. And that's important because, well, uh, if this is going to happen somehow, and we, can, we will be able to develop a network of uh, innovative enterprises, uh, startups uh, in, in all these regions, maybe together we can attract more capital from America, from other, from other areas of the world, and this is going to be beneficial not only for, well, Romania or Poland, but for the entire region as, as a whole. So the lesson, the lesson was, Let's turn to the, um, um, the legal framework. Let's make it more stable. Let's um, consolidate uh, uh, our fiscal system and consolidate the, uh, the banking system. And the National Bank has, has, has um, uh, I think, uh, done a very good job in preserving uh, um, uh, um, monetary stability of Romania uh, during that crisis. Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? Uh, good afternoon. Um, yeah, well, I'm very interesting. Um, although um, I just want to have I have one question really about the whole kind of innovation and and startups thing, 
because uh, I'm an Englishman, but I've sort of worked on startups and, and incubators and, and basically launching some businesses out of Poland for the last 15 years. And I don't know, it's a comment really, and then if anyone wants to come back, I'd be very interested in your opinions. But the thing for me is, is that, you know, you talk about this startup region, and you talk about this innovation, and that all of this funding is available. And this is, this is like one of the key sort of growth factors of our, of our economy, future of innovation and, um, you know, Polish businesses and all of this kind of stuff coming through this, um, this funnel. Um, the thing is, is that Poland doesn't buy from Poland. And Central Europe doesn't really buy from Central Europe when it comes to innovation and startups, right? You're nodding your head there, yeah, you see? And the thing is, is that I can sell, you know, my inventions in the UK uh, or in the US or sometimes in Scandinavia. But I can only actually sell them in Poland if I actually rebrand one of my companies as an English or a German company. That's the only way I can do it. So I've observed that the thing is, is that you've got these state companies and the state has to start to sort of be a customer. Um, and so we build all of these technology parks uh, and all of these you know, impressive buildings and incubators and we spend all this European money. But at the end of the day, when the funding runs out, there are no customers. So what is being done, or is there any blueprint that's being followed, or can we follow that? Is there any case study, maybe from Finland or Estonia, whereby the state is actually a customer of innovation, finally, not just a funnel for European money? And what can we do to change that? Thank you, Jake. Uh, although it's well, uh, it's, it's it, you mentioned you mentioned, of course, the case of Poland. But I'm, I'm familiar with one of the most successful uh, stories, as far as I'm concerned, uh, um, in Poland. Uh, it, is, it is about uh, what happened in the southern part of Poland in the Rzeszow area. There is, probably most of you know already, there is a kind of aviation valley. A region that has been developed through this model, this golden triangle, business community, uh, local authorities, and let's say academic or education entities that have managed to work together and create a, one of the most vibrant uh, in terms of innovation areas of Poland. And that was uh, something that could be replicated in other parts of Poland. It is, it is already being done. Uh, but I think, I, mean, I, I have a dream that such a, an example could be, could be replicated in, in, in Romania and other countries as well. And we can see maybe in 10 years from, out, from now, uh, uh, I, I, I hope maybe 20, 25, 30, uh, well, Silicon Valley type of regions in Central Europe. And that's really feasible. Uh, using once again this, this uh, very sophisticated combination uh, of co or cooperation between, once again, the business community, local authorities, and education entities. This has worked in Central Europe, in Poland, and we will try to catch up in Romania as well. Um, let me add uh, something like that. That's, uh, if you look at the EU type of the time uh, table showing the innovation and so on and so on, then you will land with those countries or the region somewhere on the on the on the end of the of the table. But that's not actually not uh, not uh, fully true because uh, some of the economists would say simply. Uh, if you are growing faster than the other, then you must be innovative. The point is how you measure this innovation. And uh, the truth is that uh, in the case of Poland, let me use Poland as an example, but I guess to bigger and small degree it applies to everybody. Uh, in this golden triangle, there was a situation that, okay, the government was not uh, uh, doing everything possible to, to, to create a good environment for that. The science sector, the, the, the academia was not kind of reformed enough to be forced to, to work together. And the business was not interested enough because the cheap labor is something much easier to use than the innovations. In a sense, I must say something that that's against a general mood of economists in Poland that see the um, problems of Poland with the weak demographic prospects and with, uh, without unemployment any long anymore. Uh, the growing costs they see as, as a threat for the, for the growth. 
for me, this is something that will force, in a sense, will make it much more natural for the business to search for the innovations, the growing cost of labor, the, the smaller number of the, of the people with, obviously, if the government creates the right incentives, the right uh, framework for that, uh, if the academia is, is, is uh, if the academia joins, then I must say uh, I can imagine the situation that even without a specific policy of the government, the economies of this region would become much much more innovative than than in the past. Because in the past it was simply not the the most profitable model to to develop new ideas, new uh, in a situation when you could have bought simply. Uh, uh, out, a slightly outdated uh, West German machinery that would have increased your productivity by 50% or something like that. You didn't have to invent a new one, right? Now we are closer to the situation in which the businesses will be forced to, to search for innovation. So in my view, there will be much more of the natural forces that are pushing us towards the innovations uh, than in the past. I personally hate the word innovation because I don't know what it means and I'm big, a, a big fan of defining the concepts we use as we speak. Uh, famously, Socrates said that uh, wisdom starts with a definition of terms. So, but I think there is a deep insight in, what, in, in your comment because what you actually said is, you know, we, we are merely uh, starting to think about setting up a valley, some kind of valley, be it silicon or coal valley. And th those companies should jump, jump up there, and then they will thrive somehow. Well, we, we, I, I'm a big fan of, of organic thinking. That's the way I developed my company. And it, it, it actually is something that you said in, at the end of, 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 your, uh, of your response, uh, that you need to look for opportunities. You need to develop things that you can actually buy afterwards. You need uh, to develop things which are products that are needed for which there are clients. And in that sense, I think the Zeshov is a good example of uh, you know, big international companies which saw an opportunity to have cheap labor costs, but which also saw an opportunity in terms of innovation, which was locally. Uh, I think there is a lot of uh, opportunity for Polish startupers, not necessarily for the companies who are already in existence, in trying to move the already established industrial Polish companies who are producing machines, for example, for, for big foreign production companies and exporting them, cheaper machines, which will need to be upgraded to the IoT model, Internet of Things model. Yeah? So we shouldn't be thinking about replicating Silicon Valley. We should be thinking about how Polish startups could help already established industrial Polish companies who are producing hardware which very often are family-owned businesses, which don't have uh, a consciousness about uh, modernizing, developing, innovating, uh, and provide them with insights and with, with new technologies which could make those companies actually survive the next wave of upgrades when those, for example, big companies like Siemens or others, big production companies in Western Europe decide, now is the moment when we go into Industry 4.0 and all, all deliveries from companies from Central Europe which are not equipped with IoT uh, are out of, of our delivery system. So in that sense, uh, we need to be more sophisticated in our thinking about startups and oriented towards potential customers for them. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's a very thought-provoking uh, note on which to end. So I'd like to thank the panel, uh, Professor Wolofsky and uh, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. very much for your time.